This is the Forbes Books Podcast, conversations with amazing humans who are impacting the world of business and beyond. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and have you ever been curious about the whole consultancy scene? I know I have. Well, my guest today is Dr. Mary Ciani, the author of The Consultant's Compass. In her book, she dishes out real-life stories and deep thoughts, urging us to rethink how we see consultants. She digs into the many sides of consultancy, busting myths, and giving us a new take on the mysterious world of consulting. Mary's now teaching as a clinical assistant professor at NYU, but she has decades of experience working at leading firms like Corn Ferry and Willis Towers Watson. Mary, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here, Joe. Thank you so much for taking the time, and I'm going to be fully transparent here from the jump, Mary. Uh, I worked in radio for a long time, and the four scariest words from our boss was, we just hired a consultant. We just hired a... I, I, that's more than four words. But when that consulting word gets dropped on people, it's scary. Why are we so scared of consultants? Well, my very first experience uh, with consultings was when I heard those same words in a financial service company that I was working for. And I had never interacted with consultants. And I asked a colleague of mine, like, so who are these consultants? What do they do? And his comment to me, which is kind of a famous phrase now in consulting is, well, they ask you for your watch and they tell you the time. And he just walked off kind of in a huff. I thought to myself, well, it doesn't seem like he has a lot of respect for consultants. And I think because when consultants go into an organization, it's usually a signal that something's going to change, right? And we don't, as human beings, we don't like change. So there is something that's under investigation. There's something that's going to be happening. It's a an opportunity for someone outside of our own organizations to kind of shine a light maybe on uh, problems or opportunities that we don't want to pay attention to. So so I think it's, it's for that reason. And, and I think the other piece of it is sometimes we as consultants overstep our bounds and we have to remember that uh, we're not the decision makers, right? We're not the implementers. We're just there to provide advice, counsel, information, data, but ultimately it's up to the client to make those choices. And in some cases, we um, maybe get too enthusiastic um, and try to step into the client's shoes. Now, um, for many years, consultants were sort of the, I mean, for lack of a better phrase, the silent assassins of the business world. Like no one really knew what a consultant company, like there was, the consultant companies weren't household names. They weren't like IBM or, or Coca-Cola. But now, here in 2024, people know consultants. There's a lot of books written about consultants. Famously, John uh, Oliver on, on HBO did a whole 30-minute episode about McKinsey. So why do you think we are becoming... And Oh, and I should mention Mary Sianna's book, The Consultant. <laughs> why do you think all of a sudden here in 2024 and here in the late uh, 2000s, we're becoming more aware of the role of consultants? Primarily because the issues that organizations dealing with are more complex and they require a different kind of support. Those complexities, whether it's dealing with COVID, the pandemic, or the increase in mergers and acquisitions, which is most of the work that I did, or uh, moving to a digital transformation, consultants are involved in those. And they're also topics that the media likes to write about, right? So oftentimes the voices, the anecdotes are coming from consultants. So I think it does become uh, something that we're used to now seeing in the press. We're used to seeing consulting firms connected uh, to different storylines and that it, it does starts to make us household names. And, w and one of the things that came out in all the publicity, is, it was, I mean, I don't want to focus on this on McKinsey, but, and, and something you talked about was like mergers and acquisitions and the McKinsey part of it is, the conflict of interest, because some of these consultancy firms are so huge that they're touching upon everyone in every vertical. Talk to me about conflict of interest within consultancy, because like you said, they don't make the decisions. They're not the one. They're not the main arbiters here, but they can put their thumb on the scale in a certain direction that will behoove them. So and again, this was sort of like, as I joked about, like the silent assassins, but this is sort of like the dark cloud that has, has kind of been around consultancy over the last few years. 
Yeah, and, and I think it's, you know, the there there are those stories, but I think there's more positive stories about the way consultants add value. And I think in terms of a, a conflict of interest, it's whether you're, it's the name of the consulting firm or whether you're an independent consultant, at the end of the day, that's all you have is your reputation, right? And I know at least for the firms that I worked for, um, client confidentiality, protecting the rights of the clients, making sure that we we weren't involved in any conflicts of interest. Again, I did a, lo- a lot of M&A work. We always had to uh, disclose if we knew about the deal in advance, uh, that information was shared. So I think there are more positive stories about the integrity and the ethics of consultants. And I remember one time I was being interviewed by this journalist and he kept trying to get me to disclose client names. Well, what about this merger? What about that merger? And I kept avoiding it and saying, you're not going to get it. And he said, you're more challenging to interview than somebody in the CIA. And I took that as a badge of honor. Like that made me proud. It's like, no, we we protect our clients in in every way that we can. All right. So let's talk about becoming a consultant because we've talked about the current state of it, you know, the, the some of the major players, and you've obviously written a book about it. And I know Mary growing up in Eastern Pennsylvania, uh, eating the fine pizza and skiing the slopes there, you probably didn't go to your grammar school first grade teacher and say, I want to be a consultant one day. So when did the I want to be a consultant one day conversation happen in your life? Well, and it, it happened late. I never even thought I wanted to be a business person. So my career was uh, planning to be an elementary school teacher with a minor in psychology. And then I went the psychology route and wound up getting a PhD in counseling psychology. Um, I was working as a director of career services and the dean of the business school tapped me on the shoulder and said, would you think about uh, joining our faculty? I'd like someone from a behavioral science background. And as I started to move into working more and thinking about organizations, I decided to get some corporate experience. Um, So I was at my desk one day and my phone rang and it was the senior vice president of OD. And he said to me, Mary, you're a psychologist, right? I wasn't quite sure where he was going with that. (laughs) I'm a little nervous about where he might be going with that. Uh, But I proceeded to say yes. And he said, well, I, I have this challenging vice president we're working with. I thought maybe because you're a psychologist, you could figure him out. So I had no clue what I was doing. I had never thought about any kind of internal consulting, but I started to work with this vice president. And what I realized is that my skills as a psychologist, being able to listen, being able to help frame a problem, were in fact consulting skills. And I love the fact that it was uh, project-based, it was intense, I could learn about so many different things. This was a vice president in charge of customer service. I knew nothing about it, but I learned. And I think it was really that opportunity of almost someone putting me in a role that I later thought, oh, that's consulting and just falling in love with it. That's great. What a great story. I mean, I, I mean, name of the book could have been the accidental consultant too, because it's not something that you had. <laughs> it absolutely <you'd> was one. <laughs> yeah, reached out. Yeah. Um, and so, if, if you don't mind going back to that story when you got that call, that mysterious call about you being a psychologist, they said you need to, to I'm not to change your words, but to, like, to fix someone. What What was the issue at that point that they brought you in for? If, if you're if you're allowed to, like, and it could speak in generalities. Yeah. I'm curious, yeah, like, yeah. especially coming like a cold call. It's not like you were a consultant. You're like, hey, I know you work with this, but this is like a complete cold call. What were they expecting you to do? Yeah, so this was um, again. I was working in a financial service company, so it's an it was an internal client. But what had happened is that three other uh, consultants who were in fact consultants went to meet with this vice president, and. I think that what happened was he was trying to tell his story and he wasn't a linear storyteller. He just went all over the map, but they kept trying to give him a solution before they had even helped him to frame the problem. So I think the vice president thought that my psych- my training as a psychologist would help to figure out what in fact this vice president wanted, um, that perhaps my skills could, you know, that I could figure out what John was trying to uh, was trying to say. I love that. That's great. And so you identify this career that would be the next step of your life. But like, what steps do you take from there? Like at that point, are, are we are you going online, like looking for consultancy jobs? Like 
how do you make that jump to becoming the you know the accidental consultant to being like a full blooded consultant? It took me a little bit a little bit of time and a and a bit of a, a journey. So I decided at that point, as I was working as an internal consultant, that I was in fact going to pursue an academic career because it's drilled into you if you get a PhD that the only worthy job is to be a faculty member. So I um, got a position as in a school of business, but I took that internal client with me and now I'm an external consultant and I'm you know flying every other week, flying to uh, visit with him and continue the work. And that got me started doing consulting uh, as an independent consultant. What I found um, as I went through my academic career is that I was loving consulting more than the teaching. Now, I got tenure, I got promoted, but I decided to take my experience in central Pennsylvania as a consultant and see if I can make it in the big firms. And that's when I wound up working in a human, uh, human capital consulting firm and realizing that even though I had about 10 years of consulting experience, I really knew nothing about it, that it was a totally different um, game of, of working as part of a large firm. Um, and that's really the impetus for my book, because I really wanted others to understand the challenges, uh, but also the joy of working in a consulting firm and being in the profession. That's cool. And can you describe what the jump was like going from being an independent consultant, sort of an entrepreneur consultant, to joining a larger firm? What were, what were some of the big differences between the two? I think one of the bigger differences is that um, I was now, when I was joined a firm, w working with folks that were just amazing, um, that had a great deal of experience, that had a great deal of technical expertise. I wasn't a specialist. I was really a, a generalist working across lots of different areas of, of HR and uh, organizational development. Uh, and these folks are deep, deep experts. So I felt a little bit um, out of my game, right? I really felt like I, I didn't have that strong uh, specialist expertise, which wound up actually uh, working in, in my favor. I think the other aspect was the uh, size of the companies that I was working for. I was working for very small companies as an independent, and now I was working with you know Fortune 500 companies, and that too was a very different experience. I think the final thing is that when I was working by myself, it was really trial and error, and we didn't have Google then, so I couldn't just Google, you know, well, what are the ways of of conducting a process improvement project. You know, I had to go to the library and buy books and do those kinds of things. But when you're in a firm, there's a methodology and you're learning a, a new way of consulting. You're learning a consistent way of working with your clients. Um, and, and you're not just representing yourself. You're representing the firm, right? So it's something bigger than you are. And one of the things, you know, you describing it, I almost feel like uh, consultants are sort of like the EMS of business. Like you're called on when there's an emergency. But is it always an emergency? Is it always something broken that consultants are fixes? Or are they sometimes there for positive reinforcement? How, how does that work, uh, you know, when, when, a, when a company hires a consultant? Yeah, I think there's different reasons why companies hire consultants. And certainly one is when something's broke or they require an expertise that they don't have and they need to go externally. But a lot of times it's about how do we make things better, right? How do we improve the employee experience? Um, how do we revamp our uh, compensation systems to uh, drive uh, you know, different behaviors or reward people uh, so that we can, in fact, retain them? So a lot of times it's about how do we make things better? How do we improve things in a way um, where we don't wind up in a crisis situation? Now, there's, there's often, and I go back to COVID, there's often situations that lead us to a crisis situation. Uh, situations that nobody's ever experienced before. And I think one of the values that consultants bring is they have not only their own experience, but we're working across a lot of different organizations. So we're, we're gaining experience about how different companies handle things, which is often a value to our clients. And you mentioned one last note about your, your time as, as sort of like a solo uh, consultant. You mentioned that you were more of a generalist. And then when you Join a uh, bigger firm, you had to become more of a specialist. 
And my boss always says is there's there's riches in the niches. Uh, talk to me about sort of that being the generalist, but then having to sort of hone and craft those specialties within the work that you're doing. Um, was that tough? What, what was that process like for you? Yeah, I remember when I for, was first hired, a very wise consultant said to me, you have to have a sound bite. People need to know what it is you can do for them, whether it's a, a colleague or a client. And he advised me, he said, you don't need to have just one sound bite, but you need to know who your audience is. Um, so for me, again, it was coming from a broad, broad background of being a psychologist, of working across different aspects of human resources. And it was finding an, a niche. Um, I was fortunate in that one of my very first assignments was working on a large merger in the pharmaceutical industry. And I decided that that could be my specialization, M&A, but it also required that I be a generalist because when you're working on a large integration, you have to be able to work across all aspects of the, of the employee experience. So I got to be known as someone who did M&A work, but it still allowed me to be that generalist. And you know, I, you know, I write, I write in my book about today what I call the top of the T. Right, we start out being specialists, but then we have to be broad. Um, is actually what our clients need. You know, they need us to be able to see all of the different aspects of a situation to be able to connect the dots for them. And it's not that we don't often call upon a specialist to come in and help with a very particular area, but the kind of consulting that I love doing was when we could really be broad. You know, we could really help our clients think about the challenges that we're facing that brought in a lot of different perspectives. And talk to me about the nuance of M&A, because it's one of those things where it's not cut and dry, you know, a winner or a loser. If a merger and acquisition is done correctly, everybody wins. Um, so how do you thread that needle of making sure that, you know, again, you're working for the one client, but you, as when you want for an MA to be successful, everyone really has to win out on it. How, how did you find this sort of, and sorry, sorry for using a tired business phrase here. How did you find your secret sauce of being able to get that done? Yeah. And when you talk about M&A and one of my colleagues always said, if you've worked on one M&A, you worked on one M&A, right? It wasn't done. <laughs> Uh, because um, everyone had a different nuance, right? Different yeah. cultures, different sizes, different um, deal strategies. For me, it was knowing that a merger or an acquisition was going to have some downsides, right? It was going to have, uh, you know, you, you don't need two CFOs. You don't need two heads of HR. I mean, so there's, there's just by the very nature of it, uh, there's going to be some challenges ahead. And what I tried to do was to really think about the people that I was supporting in that client organization, the people that did, as we mentioned before, have to make the tough decisions that we were providing expertise. And, and I remember uh, one of the stories in my book was a colleague said, um, he said, I remember working with you on this really messy M&A. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, what a messy M&A hoping I wouldn't say that out loud because I was just feeling so nervous. And he said, but you understood the tough position our client was in, and you were able just to bring in a, a calm and a comfort that helped him to deal with that. So I think that's part of our role um, as consultants. And then one line in my book is to become a consultant, chat GPT can't replace, right? Because it's that empathy that we bring to the situation, not just the knowledge, not just the expertise. Um, and I remember an, another large, messy M&A we were working on, and, and I was the client engagement lead. And the integration leader said to me, you know, your consultants on your team are so different because they're the only ones that understand what we're going through as, as human beings. They're always sensitive. They're always checking into us to see how we're doing, not just filling out the spreadsheets. So I think it's bringing that humanity to it. And also, just being honest and transparent. Now, I, I had, in addition to doing M and A work as a consultant, I was a chief people officer for a while in a company that acquired several organizations. So I've been in that seat. And then the firm that I worked for went through two back-to-back -back merges of equals. So I was also experiencing it myself. And, and I think that really helped that I knew what it was like to be in that period of uncertainty and ambiguity that often comes along with the merger. Wow, that's awesome. Great story. Thank you for sharing that one. 
for folks who want to be a, a consultant now, who will not get that random phone call from their boss and say, hey, you're a psychologist. People are now, you know, pursuing these careers early on uh, in, 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 their, in, in their education. So what are some pieces of advice, some nuggets that you'd like to share for, for the next generation of consultants? Yeah, I think anyone hoping to be a consultant has to think about the type of consultant that they want to be. Um, and, and that starts out with, you know, with the kind of organizations that you might want to work with. If you're really interested in going into management consulting or human capital consulting, um, understanding how organizations work, understanding how businesses operate. So getting that broad uh, business gra- background. I, I'd also say that one of the things that's often challenging, whether you're starting out as a new entrant right out of undergraduate or graduate school, or you're making a career shift, as many people do after working in a corporate role for a while, shifting into consultant, is to think about how comfortable you are dealing with ambiguity. Because every consulting engagement starts out in an ambiguous way. And you have to be comfortable um, dealing with that unknown. We're often presented with problems where there isn't a clear answer. And you have to be, again, comfortable dealing with the unknown. So, so if you're more interested in a kind of structured job with a title, then consulting's probably not for you. Um, if you love working on projects that have a beginning and an end, if you love working on teams, because consulting is, in fact, a team sport, um, then it may be, in fact, be something uh, worth uh, worth pursuing. Um, and there's a, a quote that I love uh, by Lucille Ball, of all people, who she talks about that she took every assignment uh, that the studios gave her, no matter how, you know, if it was a B-class movie, because she realized she was getting a paid apprenticeship. So I would say if you're interested in consulting, try it out, but know that you're going to be learning and, and find a place that uh, you will, in fact, get that mentoring and coaching. And, and I'll, I'll just say one of the things that I think about a lot is how we're developing consultants in an age where um, we're not going into work, right? We're dealing with uh, being on Zoom. And, and I remember so many of the consultants that I helped to train uh, spending time in my office or sitting at a desk together, talking about the work, going over reports. And I remember one consultant said to me one time, she said, I've you know, I really feel like I'm developing. And I said, how do you know? And she said, well, I spent less time in your office. And <laughs> it was that mentoring, right, that coaching, but she knew I, I'm getting this, right? And I don't know how you do that on Zoom. I don't know how you have those random moments of learning, of, of uh, you know, brainstorming when it's on Zoom. So I, I do think about that. And I know we need to have a balance. And we know, I know that there are folks who are working from home makes their lives easier. But I think we need to be intentional about making sure that we're mentoring and coaching that next generation um, so that they have the kinds of experiences that I was fortunate to have. No, that's great. I, I, and I agree with that balancing. I, I will say, though, for the folks that, uh, and I always laugh that, you know, remember with tech companies that, during the pandemic was like, everybody go home. You're never going to have to come back in the office. And then they realize, oh my God, we built a billion dollar headquarters. We got to get these people back here. They're like, everybody come on back. Um, but I do feel that the folks that are the the full like everyone's got to come back to the office, they they lose strength of their argument when you talk about like these moments of connecting with people because I'm sure there's someone listening to this now where they they go into the office every day and they don't see their boss once, or they'll be in wall to wall Zoom meetings in their office without experiencing life outside their office. So I feel like there needs to be some sort of adjustment to the model in the office. We know how the model works when you're working from home and everything like that. But I do feel like there's a lot of times, even, I mean, plainly, when I go in the office, I'll be so busy, I've never had, I didn't have one single interaction with someone I work with. And so, again, I think this is a part of something I've my, I've sort of been on a high horse recently about this business culture, how that we're just way too busy and we're not spending enough time in our own thoughts. But what do you think about that? Like the, the, these environments where folks are so busy that they're not having these mentorship opportunities because they're in wall-to-wall meetings or they're in an office looking at a screen where they're conducting Zoom uh, business without speaking to anyone in their office. Well, what do you think about that? Yeah, and, and and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, there's no point in going in to the office if you're going to be behind closed doors or, or in a cubicle with headphones on. 
all day long. And, and that's what I mean by being intentional is that we have to make the time for those mentoring moments. And one of the reasons I wrote my book, Joe, wasn't just to help people going into consulting, but I'm hoping that through my story and the stories of the 36 people whose oral histories I collected, that they start to think about that there's a better way to do this, right? We don't have to make the learning so challenging. So many of these consultants I interview talk about being thrown into the deep end of the pool, right? So let's teach people how to swim before we throw them into the deep end of the pool. Let's think about the compassion that we need when people are going through a hard time. Uh, let's think about how do we foster curiosity, let people try out different types of, of work, different types of projects. So, and, and some organizations, consulting firms are doing this. You know, they have well-being officers who are not just thinking about, you know, um, a fitness program or, or a nutrition program, but are really taking a look at how work is getting done, right? And how do we deal with the challenges and the stress of whether it's the travel or uh, figuring out how do we have this hybrid world where we bring people together in meaningful ways? So, so I'm hoping my book sparks conversations in consulting firms um, and just to say, uh, let's take a look at how we can make this work uh, meaningful, satisfying, but also survivable. That's awesome. Uh, one last thing from me. You talked about the intangibles that are required of, of a consultant. And I love, I love talk. I could talk about intangibles all day. But if someone's listening to this and they said, what tangible do I need? Is Would you suggest a certain degree, uh, a, a type of school they should go to just to build up you know, their resume, build up their network? What, what kind of suggestions would you give for folks who are like, all right, cool. I, I, I love ambiguity. I, I, love being, I, I love being able to get my hands dirty, work with people. But what do I need to do to, to make that job? Yeah, I think there's, there's different approaches. So if you're a, a college student, certainly the easiest path into consulting is to have a business degree or something that's you know data analytics, something that's um, in the quantitative area because you have a recognizable skill to get you started. Okay, now, now you need to develop those intangibles in addition to that, but it will give you an entry point, right? Something concrete that you can offer. As I mentioned in my book, I talk about as well career changers, people who are, uh, decide to make a pivot. And, you know, I'll put a plug in for the program I teach in at NYU, the Master of Science in Executive Coaching and Organizational Consulting, is that we, we teach those kind of coaching and consulting skills so there's at least a familiarity and understanding of what we mean by consulting. But I would then go back to my own background as, you know, I, I didn't have training as a consultant. I kind of accidentally, as you uh, described it, got into it, is to think about your own capabilities that you use in other areas, being organized, being project-based, you know, being a good team player. I mean, all of those things are skills and capabilities that can be developed in a variety of ways, either in the classroom or through volunteer activities. So it's important also to find the kind of culture, the kind of consulting organization uh, that you want and do some research, talk to people in the field. And one last thing. So I lied. One more thing, because uh, I, I always like to ask the sliding doors question. And I don't know if you've ever have been asked this, but what do you think your life would be right now if you didn't get that call from your boss saying, and we got this guy, he got some major problems. I, you, you're a psychologist, right? Can you help him out? What do you think your career would be like if you never got that call? Well, it, it certainly would have been in the academic realm. And my guess is I would have pursued a, a career path in academia um, as opposed to pivoting over to consulting because I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have known that that was an opportunity open to me. Uh, so who knows? I might have been the dean of a business school or the president of a university. I don't know. Do you think you would have been as happy as you are now? It, no, I think that's hard to say. I mean, because I always think that we're happy with the path that we take and, and that it's more than our career. Uh, but I would say that um, I I loved consulting. It gave me a lot of opportunities. And and one of the things it gave me were deep relationships. A lot of the people I interviewed in my book were colleagues. Uh, some of them were clients. And I think when you're working side by side with people in such an intense way, um, that the relationships you build really have depth to them. Um, and that's probably not something I could have replicated in another career. So I'm thankful for that. That's great. Her name is Mariciani. The book is called The Consultant's Compass, 
navigating success with courage, curiosity, and compassion. Mary, thanks so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun, Joe. Have a great day. You too. And that's going to do it for another Forbes Books Podcast. Don't forget to leave a five-star review on Apple or Spotify and hit subscribe so you don't miss any new episodes. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, and Instagram at Joe Partavilla or TikTok at Jay Partavilla. And please don't forget the golden rule and treat others as you want to be treated. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Adios.